I want to thank you for joining us here today. I have with me Superintendent Andrea Galinsky from the Chiktawaga Sloan School District and Dr. Sinrav Sengupta from the University at Buffalo. Um, I want to thank Superintendent Galinsky for hosting us here today and allowing us to have this press conference to talk about this very important issue. We are here today to talk about the dangers of social media and what we as a community can do about it. Educators have been telling us for years that there is a growing mental health crisis with today's youth and it's only getting worse. When I talk to teachers and principals and superintendents, their number one concern is an alarming rise in mental health issues with today's kids. And the data supports those observations. Between 2009 and 2019, that 10 year period, there was a 40% increase in teenagers reporting feelings of hopelessness and sadness and depression. And the pandemic has only made that worse. And now there's a growing body of research, which Dr. Sengupta will talk about, that points to excessive use of social media as one of the causes of this growing mental health crisis. For example, a 2019 study found that those who spent more than three hours on social media per day were at a heightened risk for mental health problems. One study done by Instagram itself showed that 40% of teens reported an increased incidence of body insecurity after using Instagram. Other studies done nationally and um, across, the, across the world, really, have observed that there are links between high levels of social media use and increased depression and anxiety in kids. Leaders across the country are raising alarm bells. A few weeks ago, the US Surgeon General warned that even age 13 is probably too young to allow kids to start to use social media. And just this week, President Biden mentioned this issue during the State of the Union address. From increased rates of depression to an, an anxiety to cyberbullying to even radicalization like we saw with the Topps Buffalo shooter, these platforms do have a dark side and it's time we did something about it. That's why I'm introducing legislation to create a public awareness campaign to educate kids and the public on the dangers of social media. This legislation would also require schools to teach the dangers and risks as part of their curriculum. Just like we teach kids and their parents about the dangers of tobacco use and drug use and reckless driving, we need to start teaching about the dangers of social media. We need to help them and their parents recognize the warning signs before it's too late and give them the tools that they need to help them to cope with some of the negative aspects of social media. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Andrea Galinsky, who has been with the Chictawaga Sloan School Union Free School District for over 20 years. It's a district of about 1,400 students. Uh, she previously served as the principal at Woodrow Wilson Elementary School and has been outspoken on the issues of social media and how it fuels gossip, misinformation, and cyberbullying. Um, so she's going to give you the perspective from an educator, and then I will we will turn it over to Dr. Sengupta, who will talk about it from the perspective of an academic who studies this issue and a practitioner who works with children on mental health issues. So, um, Andrea you. Galinsky. <coughs> Good morning. Thank you so much, Assemblymember Monica Wallace, for this opportunity to speak th this morning on such an important topic. Um, it's also an honor to be joined here by Dr. Sengupta um, from the University of Buffalo, um, a place where I also attended. So it's an honor to be here today. It is important for me to begin by saying that communicating through the use of social media certainly has its advantages when done respectfully and responsibly. Unfortunately, the norm that we are seeing in our schools today seems to be the contrary. The level of misinformation, inappropriate comments, gossip, and just mean behavior on social media is what we are sadly observing. It has become far too easy for children to type something 
in an impulsive manner, which then has serious negative consequences. This communicating behind a screen has become the standard way of interacting, and it has resulted in making children feel harmed, isolated, helpless, and being unable to respond to the misinformation, lonely, and depressed. It becomes so debilitating that children who are on the receiving end of this min misinformation feel hopeless, anxious, and alone. These damaging feelings that children are experiencing is directly affecting their mental health. Children in school have enough stress in their young lives with peer relationships, balancing clubs, activities, sports, and academic work, and navigating the challenges of daily school life as they mature and grow from young children to young adults. The stress is now compounded with the additional and significant stress of social media. Children, particularly at the middle and high school level, have become consumed with who is saying what on social media about them or their friends, rather than concentrating on schoolwork. We have observed this almost addictive social media behavior resulting in severe student distraction, students becoming distraught, sad, depressed, anxious, and worried. Social media never turns off, and this is emotionally draining for our youth and negatively impacts their mental health. This behind the screen communicating also has us very concerned with how social media has impacted students' ability to socialize and interact with others in an appropriate manner and engage in face-to-face, in-person interactions. As a way to address the negative impacts that we are observing from social media, we are spending additional time in school teaching children how to appropriately communicate in a healthy and productive manner and how to safely use social media. We hope that by raising awareness on the negative impacts that social media can have on children and their mental health and by continuing to educate students on how to appropriately and respectfully use social media that we will make a positive difference in the lives of children and their overall mental health. And again, as the leader of a school district, I can't thank Monica Wallace enough for her passion behind this topic and for advocating to bring greater awareness to it. Thank you. I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Sengupta. Oh, let me just, can I just, yes. yeah. I just want to introduce Dr. Sengupta. Let's find my notes here. So um, Dr. Sengupta uh, is uh, at the U UB's Child and Adolescent Psychology. He became their fellowship, or actually, what is that? He became a pr program director, program, I'm sorry. Yep. So Dr. Sengupta, let me do that again. Dr. Sengupta is uh, the program director at UB's Child and Adolescent Psychology Fellowship Program, which he's been part of since 2016. Um, he supervises fellows at the Children's psychology clinic and at Oshai Children's Hospital. He teaches extensively in, in clinical neurodevelopment and collaborative care and family systems. In 2013, he started the Integrated Care for Kids, a collaboration of care program and for pediatric and adult primary care settings. And he is a national educator for the REACH Institute. He serves as co-chair of the Academy of the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry's Committee on Collaborative and Integrated Care, and he consulted with healthcare organizations across the country to establish successful behavior and integration processes. So thank you so much to Dr. Sengupta for joining us today. Sengupta, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Saurav Sengupta. Um, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist at UB at the Jacobs School of Medicine at, Osh at Oshai Children's Hospital. Uh, where I have the privilege of working with children and families from all over Western New York. Um, I want to thank Superintendent Galensky for hosting us and Assemblymember Wallace for her leadership in this critical issue of our kids and social media. Um, 
I want to share just a little bit of a family story. I'll change up the details and story quite a bit for privacy, but I just wanted to share some of the, the common threads that I see every day as a child and adolescent psychiatrist in the community. Um, their teen was having a difficult time emotionally, uh, feeling down, struggling at school, isolating from her family. Um, she was struggling uh, to find a way in, in the world that felt, frankly, overwhelming. Um, her parents felt that she was spending hours late at night on her phone, doom scrolling over, you know, uh, over and over, you know, through her friends' Instagram feeds, feeling she came up short compared to their wonderful displays of happy, carefree lives. Uh, they decided to take her phone away for a month, concerned that it was worsening her sleep, her mood. As you can imagine, she was upset. Uh, this was the only way her friends got to stay in touch, make plans, have a laugh, she said. You can call them on the landline, they said. Uh, she actually hung out with friends on FaceTime while they gossiped about school drama or planned school projects. They said, we used to just meet up at the mall or the library. Um, I've been helping out with an online campaign to promote women's health in Afghanistan, she said. You're too young to be worrying about that. Besides, that's not what you're doing at 2 a.m. You're just typing and deleting and retyping comments on your friends' Insta pictures, they said. It keeps my mind off things that make me sad, she said. They said, but it keeps you from doing most of the things that make you feel better. So the thing is that both she and her parents have some good points and some blind spots. We know that when kids spend lots of time on social media, Assemblymember Wallace uh, highlighted that study, three hours or more, they're at increased risk for social isolation, lower self-esteem, decreased concentration, decreased participation in those norm normal healthy activities. We know that we can all get seduced by the curated life phenomenon presented in those beautifully filtered photos of shiny happy moments and our social media feeds, uh, forgetting that we all have ups and downs but tend to post about the ups. Um, but we also know that, especially over the past few years, that common public social space for young people has shrunk considerably. Um, anyone been to a mall lately? Um, young people need space to connect, um, explore their identities, cut loose. And while we rightly worry about the sheer amount of information uh, that they have to process on a daily basis from their academics, to the social lives of their 400 closest friends, to the gory details of the latest national tragedy on the news. Um, we also have to acknowledge that young people today have successfully leveraged social technologies to bring about much needed social change. They're often the ones holding up the mirror to say, we can do better. All this to say, social media is not all good or all bad for young people and families, but just like any other complex experience, we need them to master. Uh, think healthy eating habits, safe driving, navigating substance use. We as parents, as educators, clinicians, community leaders, need to be more engaged. Um, social media is an, a technology that's exploded onto our lives without much thought or direction as to what role it should play in family life. When and how should we use it? When and how should we not? What messages do we as parents send with our social technology use? We need to educate ourselves about the guardrails and the guidelines. It's for these reasons that Assemblymember Wallace has proposed legislation to establish a public education campaign around the mental health impacts of youth social media use is so critical right now. We need to better understand what young people are telling us about what they need socially and emotionally. We need to share ways to help them get those needs met that doesn't just rely on scrolling uh, through a screen endlessly, that allows them to build real connections with friends and loved ones, uh, that still supports their dreams of making the world a better place. We need to help our kids and teens learn how to navigate this digitally complex life and support our parents to develop healthy family strategies and role model their own healthy social technology habits. I hope you'll join us in support of Assemblymember Wallace's legislation, which will be a great next step towards a healthier relationship with social technologies for our kids and for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so with that, I do want to just highlight uh, one thing as we were speaking. Um, 
Superintendent Galinsky mentioned to me that the vast, vast majority, well over 90% of the behavioral issues and behavioral mm -hmm. issues that she addressed, that she deals with in the school district stem from social media use. So it is such a problem. And as Dr. Sengupta mentioned, um, it is a problem with our children, but it also, we need to have this awareness campaign for the parents themselves, for all of us. Um, we need to model good behavior and we need to teach our children how to, how to navigate with the tools that they have to work through this and that it's going to be okay. I mean, you know, we all can think back to our 13 year old selves and how uncomfortable and um, you know, insecure we were and social media is just amplifying that exponentially. So with that, um, that's our press conference and if anybody has any questions, uh, love to take them. What is this, uh, this uh, awareness program, what's that gonna look like? Yeah, so um, what it does is it, there's two <coughs> pieces. Uh, there's a public awareness campaign for, it, it called like a statewide youth and youth and social media campaign to promote public awareness. Um, the director of youth, I'm sorry, the director of, it requires the commissioner of education, the director of information and technology services, and the commissioner of health to get together and create this public awareness campaign statewide. That's for everyone, just like we have public awareness campaigns for tobacco use, for drug use, for eating healthy. Um, this would be similar with regard to social media, what's positive social media use, what's negative social media use. In addition to that, it directs the Board of Regents to create a curriculum for schools, um, for K through 12, to give them the tools that they need uh, to address social media in a healthy way and you know, dealing with issues of cyberbullying and so many things mm -hmm. that um, the superintendent just mentioned. So there's two components to it. You find it ironic that you're going, going to be using social media to, to speak the woes of social media? Uh, well, I, 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 well, two things. One is, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would consider, I guess, you, you know, maybe, somewhat, but as Dr. Sengupta mentioned, you know, it is part of our lives. It's just like you, you were mentioning the analogy of food. Uh, we, we, food is part of our lives. We can't live without it, but we want to make sure that people use food in a healthy way, eat healthy. We want it that we created public awareness campaigns around that. That's similar to what this is. You know, social media is part of our life. It has positive things but there are negatives, there's a dark side of it and we want to give people the tools that they need to help navigate it and help them understand. Um, I was mentioning just on a personal level, I deleted Facebook off my phone earlier this year and I cannot tell you how much better that has been just in the past month that I did it um, to not look at that all the time. You know, I look at it occasionally but I don't do it all the time and it has been really good for my own mental health and I'm mm -hmm. not a 13 year old child. So, um, so there we go. The places that we used to hang out as kids don't exist anymore or yeah. they're not cool anymore or whatever. So, I mean, does there need to be places for kids to go and things for them to do mm -hmm. where they don't have their phones? Yeah, I think that that would be great. I mean, you know, I'm of the generation of the roller skating rinks <laughs> and hanging out at the malls. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I am, I have children who are, teenagers and just a little older than that and I lament that they are not engaging more in person. Mm -hmm. I remember just anecdotally I had to teach my son how to leave a message mm -hmm. on the phone because you know he the first time I told him to call somebody I think I, I you know uh, he had to make the phone call and he got so nervous he hung up so I had to like do a role play with him. Um, they're just not doing yeah. these these mm -hmm. skills that we just were so inherent that we grew up with so you know I think that um, that that it would be great if we can encourage them to get together more in settings like the uh, parents did with the one child that, that the doctor was speaking about, uh, where they took away her phone for a while and it encouraged her to um, engage in other ways. Well, I mean, if you remember back in the day when you go into the mall and stuff, parents, Excuse were, me. Concerned, parents were concerned about people at the mall. People, you know, they're always, parents are always concerned about something. So is this just a natural progression of how these I, things happen that used to happen in the mall or the schoolyard or somewhere else 
I don't think so because, and I'll let the doctor speak to this directly, <laughs> um, you know, we're seeing a mental health crisis with our kids that did not exist when we were younger. And we now have research that suggests that, uh, that one of the causes of that is this proliferation of social media. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you anecdotally, as somebody who's, you know, a confident mm -hmm. person with a career, it affects me sometimes when I look at social media and in a negative way. And I have the tools. I've already developed those tools to deal with it. I don't have a changing body. I don't have the lack of self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, maybe I do, but, you know. <laughs> I don't have the lack of self-confidence uh, that, that these kids have. You know, I, don't, I have a network. Um, they're all trying to navigate through that with hormones that are, you know, really kind of throwing them off. And I'll let the doctor speak to that. <coughs> That's a really interesting question. I appreciate that. You know, so this idea, though, of, of social contagion, right? So this idea that how quickly can ideas and comments sort of spread uh, via the social media platforms, that that really wasn't an analog to when we were, it would be like if we were at the mall and you could hear everything that everyone mm -hmm. said about you all the time, and as soon as there was a little bit of drama, you immediately got whisked directly to that drama to comment on it and engage in it. Um, so there's this kind of amplification um, that, uh, that these social media platforms really sort of provides that's really challenging. And the other the thing that, that's really challenging about this is that these companies are basically making a profit off the misery of our adolescents. Um, their algorithms are set up just to, you know, primarily take a look at the things that are causing the most kind of challenge and drama and bringing that straight to their eyeballs. And I think that's, that's mm -hmm. different and something that we have to tackle differently. How big of a role did the pandemic and the lockdowns and all that play into this? That that might have been the only way for kids to communicate and be more dependent upon it than they used to be. So I, I think we have to really acknowledge that as well, that social technologies were really a lifeline during the mm -hmm. pandemic. And I think that's what we're really hoping for is that families, educators, we have to really re-engage in this space and understand the nuance between mm -hmm. these things. Social media use, social technology use that actually promotes real life connections with people, that's valuable. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the things that just have me sort of passively scrolling and, and consuming, less so. Um, but we need to actually get in there as adults and sort of help children and teens understand the differences between those things. Mm -hmm. You want to FaceTime with your friend that you haven't seen in a while or, or talk to grandma you know, over in a different state, I love that. Mm -hmm. We can actually really mm -hmm. still encourage that. But you want to, you know, sit there and, you know, look at your friends, you know, 200 comments on their picture mm -hmm. of their puppy. I don't know that really does a lot to help you. Um, I mean, everybody, when they were adolescents, had to talk, right? Is this, is this a second talk that people are going to have to have with their kids? I'll let you answer this, too, or anybody else who sure. wants to weigh in on this, feel free to weigh in on this. But I would say that it's, it's not... It's not the talk. I mean, we're talking about, I think parents themselves sometimes don't even know how to get, navigate correctly through social media. So I think we would all benefit from a public awareness campaign and learning um, really what, it, and there's a lot of um, you know, neuropsychology that's being shown now that, that the, you get a dopamine high from this that it's taking away from other activities that create happiness. Um, and in a very negative way. So, but I'll let the doctor speak to that, and then also if Andrea sure. wants to weigh in uh, at all. How do you have parents, you know, uh, sure. encourage them to talk about these things? Sure. As a as a parent myself, it is absolutely um, a very big job, and you know, my husband and I have made it a priority. Um, every day, we're talking about this in the house about being responsible um, with technology. Um, you know, as Monica shared some personal information, my son's going to be 13, and he does not have a cell phone yet. Um, I think there's a certain maturity level when the children are ready and can handle this a little bit better. Um, but, you know, it's a, it definitely as parents, um, and I would certainly encourage all of our parents, and I think our parents are wonderful, and I think they do see the need for this too. It is a collective approach. It's parenting, it's school, um, it's everybody together, just reminding students, children, that they have to be responsible. It's, a, it's, a, it's ever so important even then, you know, what they're repeating in school because, you know, certain words just aren't acceptable. Um, and just bringing an awareness to kindness, too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Doctor. And, and just related to that, too, you know, again, um, you know, when my kids are asking questions about their body or their body changes, I have books and materials mm -hmm. that I can share with them, right? This is, the, this is the book on your changing body, right? Here's the information from the American Academy of Pediatrics that I can 
kind of you know work with. We need that similar sort of piece here, you know, with visual technologies, social media, and, and with kids. And and but I agree with Assemblymember Miles. I think we probably need to have a little bit of this talk with ourselves as well.